Yahoo News reported recently that an Applebee's waitress was fired for posting a customer's receipt online. The offending receipt was for a bill of $34.93. The person had been part of a large party, so 18% gratuity had already been added. And then there was another line on the bill for additional tip. Well, the person scratched out the added gratuity, wrote zero for additional tip, and then she wrote, I give God 10%, why do you get 18? And then signed it, Pastor Alois Bell. So the waitress was so offended, she showed it to someone else she worked with. They posted online, and then the thing went viral and was all over the internet. But Bell, who was a pastor at, listen to this church name, Truth in the World Deliverance Ministries Church, that's a church, has been drag, she's been dragged through the mud. She said, my heart is really broken. I've brought embarrassment to my church and ministry. And the waitress in the news story was quoted as saying, if this person wrote the note, obviously they wanted it to be seen by someone. I've been stiffed on tips before, but this is the first time I've seen the big man used as reasoning. We're starting a short two-week series today called The Generosity Dare. And the next week, I'm going to give you a specific challenge that is the dare, a dare I'm going to ask you to take me up on. And the reason for this series is we believe following God results in generosity, unlike that story. But I want to talk to you about money. And money is a unique topic in the church. It's a unique topic anywhere because people are so emotional about money. It's a unique topic in the church because we've seen and heard it talked about poorly and so that doesn't help things. I like the story from Rick Warren. He said he was watching this televangelist on TV, and he was saying, if you send me $100, God will send you $1,000. And he kept saying this, and, and Rick Warren was getting tired of it, so he picked up the phone, called the guy, and said, hey, I got an idea. You send me 100 bucks, God will send you 1000 bucks, and we'll both be happy. But scholars Lee and Wembley explain two metaphors we need to understand to see the role money plays in our lives. They say that money is a tool, And that money also is a drug. For a long time, economists thought of money only as a tool. We value money because it's useful. We get work done. We get fed, keep the lights on. We see this in the Bible in Jesus' parable of the talents. A master gives three different servants a certain amount of talents, a certain amount of money. And he says, put this to work on my behalf. It's using money as a tool. But the tool theory of money left some questions unanswered, like, why is it that people who are already rolling in money want to have more? Or why does the person who has a ton of money make sacrifices to get more? See, when, I, when it comes to my tools, I don't have a deep emotional connection to my tools. I mean, my wife I could, t- could tell you I don't have much connection at all to my tools. But money is a tool. But money is also a drug. Money makes us do things we wouldn't otherwise do. It makes us feel things we wouldn't otherwise feel. It gives us a temporary escape from pain or a fleeting sense of well-being. So we create money because we want the buzz. And the biblical writers knew all about this. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, People who want to get rich, who long to be rich, fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Now, if you replace be rich with the phrase, get artificially relaxed with alcohol or drugs, the parallels are scary. Money's a tool. Money's a drug. And the biblical language would be money is a servant or money's an idol. The great question is, am I using money as a tool for good for God or am I using it as a drug for me? Am I storing up treasures in heaven or on earth? Money's a great tool Money is a lethal drug. What a great thing it would be if we could become free from using money as a drug and begin using it as a tool for good. So I'm going to try to do the same thing in this series that I do every series. And it's based on a core conviction. I believe the Bible is God's word. I believe it is our inspired guide for life. And I believe all of it's true, not just the parts about heaven, not just the parts about grace. I believe all of it. So when the Bible talks about sex and marriage, when it talks about parenting and careers, when it talks about church and even money, I believe it's true. So I view my role here each week as this. I view my role as helping you understand why what the Bible says is true, why what the Bible tells you to do is in your best interest anyway. So today I'm going to try to convince you that being generous with your money, starting at a baseline of tithing, 
is in your best interest. Today is about this. Do you want all that God offers? I mean, it's the song the band just sang. What kind of world do you want? And the question I'm asking is, do you want all that God offers? I read in medieval times that the Knights Templar, when they were baptized by the church, would get baptized, uh, dunked underwater, but they would hold their sword up out of the water. And it was a physical way to say, God, I'm giving everything to you. I'm trusting you with everything except my sword. What happens with this? What happens in war? What happens on the battlefield stays there and is not given to you. And in a sense, I think there's a lot of Christians today who get baptized holding their wallet out of the water saying, God, you can have all of me, but don't touch this. And in this series, we're going to touch it. So let's go over a few different Bible verses. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, you must decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And this verse is key to start this series off because this series is not about guilt that's not the goal. The goal is not that you feel pressured and like, well, I, you know, I feel bad, so I guess I got to do this now. If that's the case, please don't give at the end of this series. That's not what we're trying to do here. And, and please know that this isn't about mosaic. We're not in some kind of financial crisis. Uh, if you don't give, we're still going to keep the lights on. I mean, we're doing okay financially. I'm going to go into the details more next week. But if you don't give to mosaic, if you're not giving, you continue not to give, we're going to be fine. I did have ask, somebody ask me one time, they said, Carl, so is your salary like a proportion of the offering? Is that how it works? And I said, no, our management team determines my salary. Our management team approves all our staff salaries, but that would be kind of stressful, man, if like on Sunday afternoon, I'm checking my email from the accounting team like, okay, we can eat this week. It's good. It's good, babe. We're all good. Or, or oh, babe, at Christmas time, everybody's generous. We're going to Hawaii, hon. Come on, let's go. Uh, no, that's not how it works. What this is about is you achieving God's vision for your life where you don't worry about money, where money is a tool and not a drug, and it's a tool that you're in complete control of. Now, the Bible teaches a concept called tithing, and tithing is giving away 10% of your income. I've had people tell me, Carl, I tithe $20 per month. Well, you know, unless your income is $200 per month, that's not tithing. Tithing specifically means giving away 10% of your income. And here's our central verse for this series. I'm going to read it again next week. Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Now, God doesn't get a guarantee he's going to open the financial floodgates for you, but he says, test me and see if I won't open a, up a blessing on you. And I think God is trying to teach us to give a percentage because there's power in percentage giving. In fact, the Gallup organization has actually found among Americans, uh, whatever religion or no religion at all, that people who give uh, a percentage give 40% more than those who wait for their emotions to strike them. On a year-to-year -year basis, Americans who pre-plan always give 40% more. And God wants you to do percentage giving rather than emotion giving because it will result in more generosity. And the truth is, there are a lot of you at Mosaic who are doing this, and I commend you. I, I think you're doing a great job, and I'd encourage you to keep it up. But the truth is, we need to do better. As a church, we need to do better. A couple years ago, I read a book called Passing the Plate, Why American Christians Don't Give Away More Money. These are the fun books that pastors read. And it was by a couple authors named Christian Smith and Michael Emerson. And they had done a bunch of research into the habits of American Christians. And so they did the survey, and they wanted to have a clear definition of who they were asking of. And so they constricted it to people who attended church at least twice per month. They said, that, that's going to be our definition of regular churchgoers, if you go at least twice per month. And they found that 20% of regular church, American churchgoers don't give literally a single penny to church, 20%. Now, at first when I heard that, I was a little annoyed, but then I thought, you know, that's probably good news because Mosaic's a church for people who don't go to church, and I think every church should be a church for people who don't go to church. And if you're drawing in people who've never gone to church or coming back to church after being burned or something like that, they're not going to start giving right away. They're going to be tentative. They're going to be scared. They're going to check it out. What is this I'm getting into? 
And so if we're attracting who we want to attract, then that should be true of us. The disturbing thing to me in the book is that they found 59% of the total amount churches receive is given by the top 5% of givers. And in most churches, you have just a handful of people doing most of the giving. Now, that's not entirely true at Mosaic. We don't have like two or three families who are bankrolling this church. That's not how it works. We just have a bunch of people who have decided, I'm going to put God first in my finances by giving to Mosaic. But the truth is, we can do better. Mosaic's above average when it comes to giving, but we're not perfect. And if you ask me, Carl, what's your vision for Mosaic? Or if you ask anybody here, I don't think our vision is to say, well, we just want to be a little bit above average. I think we want to be the best we can be. We want everything God has to offer us. So another Bible verse, Jesus later comes along and he mentions tithing one time, I think just one time in his ministry. And he encounters these religious leaders and he bashes them because they're following the letter of the law when it comes to giving, but not the heart of the law. Here's what he says. What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, these religious leaders, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. And let me explain what's going on here. Most of the tithing that's commanded in the Bible was based on a a farming society. And so it talked about uh, fruits and and products from the field and even animals and and tithe on those things, you know, on their labor, what they got for their labor. And what the Pharisees are doing uh, in Jesus' time is they're taking their little herb garden and tithing off that. Now, they weren't required to do this. They're specifically mentioned in the law. You don't have to tithe off of this, just off of your legit fields or whatever. Um, But they had like a basil plant growing in their windowsill, and they would look at it, and they'd say, well, that's about 10% right there. And they take that little basil leaf and like tie that to the temple or something. And they're being very legalistic. And on one hand, Jesus commends them for being so, uh, wanting so much to obey God's command on tithing, but he bashes them and says, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but don't neglect the more important things. See, the most important things are justice and mercy and love. And if you leave today thinking this is all about money or that it's all about mosaic or mosaic is all about money, then I've miscommunicated. The goal of this series is not to get you to give because if we give but don't love, we've missed it. The goal is to help you understand what God has given to you to increase your love for him and understand that if in order for you to get all that he has in store for you, you must give and obey him and trust him in that. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. So tithing is the vehicle that God put in place for us to use money as a tool and not as a drug. Now, all that's good and fine that those Bible verses are nice. A handful, several of you do that. Some of you don't. But here's the bigger picture I want you to realize today. Tithing, giving a percentage of your income, is in your best interest. See, here's my vision for your financial life. And I believe this is the biblical vision for your financial life. My vision is that you're debt-free. My vision is that you don't stress about money, worrying about how you're going to pay certain bills. My vision for you, the Bible's vision for you, is that money is a tool to be channeled and not a burden to weigh you down, that you don't have financial emergencies. So if you have car trouble or a health problem, you don't have a financial problem on top of that because you've been setting aside money just for emergencies. My vision is that you have a job where you work hard and earn earn an honest living, that you're not lazy, you're not cheating people, but you earn something you can be proud of. And the Bible's vision, my vision for you, is that you save a percentage regularly so you can later take care of yourself and those close to you and and be even more generous than you are now. And many of you who are doing this and living this out are doing so because of Financial Peace University. This is a DVD curriculum that we do as part of our growth group's semesters. It's, it's by, run by Dave Ramsey, a New York Times bestselling author, and it gives practical lessons and tools on how to manage your money in an easy, wise way. And I try to teach on money every year. About every other year, I'll teach on giving. Every other year, it'll be kind of money as a whole where I'll address debt and saving and, and giving. But on Sundays, in a 30-minute talk, even a series of 30-minute talks, we can only scratch the surface of what you really need to do to take control of your finances. And that's why Financial Peace University is such a great tool for this church, for you, if you need to get hold of your money, if you need to manage it well, if you're not sure where it's going, and get some tools for that. We have a goal. I mentioned this before, but listen. We have a goal that every single person in this church 
will go through Financial Peace University. And not sign up for it, not attend a few of the sessions and then drop out. We have a goal that every single person will go through the entire Financial Peace University course. Dozens of you have already gone through it. Some of you are going through it right now. I hope dozens of you sign up for it this summer in our next semester of groups. In fact, I got an email last month about FPU. It was from a couple that took it a year ago, and they emailed DJ and Danielle Selgo, who led the group they were in, and they copied me on it. So I just want to read that to you. It says, DJ and Danielle, I wanted to share with you a short note about how the FPU class you led for us last year has improved our lives and strengthened our marriage. During 2012, my wife and I bought our first home together. We were blessed with the birth of our first kid, and we paid off $27,400 of debt. In addition to all of that, 2012 was the first year of our lives that we have tithed to the church. It has truly been incredible how this act of giving has blessed us with more in return than we ever could have hoped. And that's the vision coming to life. But God's vision for your finances begins with you trusting God. Everyone in here would agree that God will take care of you. I mean, at least we would think we're supposed to agree with that. I mean, maybe if you've had some traumatic experience, you wouldn't say that, but you think, I, I think I'm supposed to think that God will take care of me. But in the Bible, there's always tangible proof of trust in God. So if you trust God will forgive you, you see that in baptism. If you trust God's plan for marriage, you see that in faithfulness and refusal to explore divorce. If you trust God's plan for sex, you see that in pursuing purity when you're single and even when you're married. If you trust God for eternity, you see that in how you talk to other people about Jesus and even invite them to church. If you trust God, you can always see it. Now hold on to that thought because I'm going to come back to it. If you trust God, you can always see it. Let me take a little detour. People confess a lot of things to me. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm the lead pastor, and so people pull me aside or email me or, or sometimes put on their connection cards different things they want to confess. And I, I have had people confess to me a lot of different things. I've had people confess pride and lust and hatred, racism, drug and alcohol addiction, murder, sex outside marriage. There are not many things that people have not confessed to me. But you know something that nobody's ever confessed to me? Greed. I've never had anyone come up to me in humility and contrition with tears running down their face and say, Carl, will you please pray for my great sin of greed? Isn't that interesting? Now, somebody's greedy. I mean, I think we'd all agree that there's this great evil in our world called greed that exists, but we never think it's us. I mean, I never think it's me, and that's a scary thought. We think the opposite of greed is not having everything we want, so as long as there's something more we want, we think I'm not greedy because I'm not getting that. But the opposite of greed is not, excuse me, the opposite of greed is not wanting in the first place. It's contentment, and the antidote to greed is generosity. So if nobody ever recognizes their greed, and the antidote to greed is generosity, then if you're generous, you could at least rationalize, well, even if I'm greedy, I know I'm doing something in response to that. Does that make sense? Are you tracking with me? If you are generous, you can at least think, well, I'll probably never recognize if I'm greedy, so if I'm generous, I can at least know I'm doing something in response. But if you're not generous, how do you know that your greatest sin isn't greed? I'm not saying that if you aren't generous, then you are greedy. I'm just asking, how do you know? If you keep it all, how do you know? Now, I know I'm prodding here, but I'm doing it on purpose because I want God's vision for your life. Trusting God can always be seen. Greed can rarely be seen. Greed is a heart issue. Greed doesn't have to do with what you have or what you don't have. You cannot look at someone's life and know if they are greedy or not. They cannot look at you and know if you are greedy or not. But you can look at how generous you are and see if you have trust in God. My wife and I can look at our checkbook from the past nine and a half years of marriage and see that every year we have increased our trust in God. And the question is, do you trust in God for eternity but not your finances? Or do you want all that God has to offer? Jesus said, I will give you the fullest life possible. 
And I want that. I want to trust God with my sex life and my marriage and my parenting and my job and my exercise and my finances. Because here's the deal. I refuse to believe that God is simply a get-out-of-hell-free card meant to be exploited in a divine trade-off. I don't think that I just do a couple things and say a couple things and he grants me eternity and that's a great transaction. I believe that God wants what is best for me. I believe that God wants what is best for you. And I want all that he has to offer, not just a little bit of it. Gene Apple said this, sometimes I wonder how it is you can trust God for your eternal destiny, but you can't trust him with your finances. How is it we can trust him for answered prayer in your life day to day that you depend on, but you can't trust him to honor your gifts by blessing them? I guess I just feel sorry for anybody who lives with a crippled confidence in such an able God. Do you want all that God has to offer? Now, it's one thing for Carl to say this. I want you to hear from some other people. When I was preparing this series, I emailed several people at Mosaic who I know are generous. And I said, hey, I have this series on generosity coming up, and I'm going to teach what the Bible says on generosity. I know why I'm generous, but I want to hear from you. Why are you generous? And I I just want to read, if you don't mind, a few of the emails that I got in response to this. Here's the first one. We tithe because the Bible tells us to. What we have is not ours, so we need to be at least tithing. Almost as a repercussion of that, It seems that we give, and then when we need the money, it seems to appear. Random checks we weren't expecting, refunds we were not expecting. We had paid too much, and then random money returned. That's not why we tithe, but we feel that when we give, we always seem to have money when we need it. Not that it's a guarantee. We would still tithe if none of that happened. Regarding generosity in general, if we have money and can use that to build relationships with people, then that is a resource we can use to bring people to Christ. We have so many luxuries in life. If we keep our mind open, we are given the chance to put a smile on someone's face through a gift, whether it be money, a bike, a dinner, a food bag on their porch. And we can always be generous with our home, whether it's for a small group, a party, needing needing a place to sleep. Why have this stuff if we can't share it? It's a great way to live, to have ours be yours. It's almost freeing in a way. And then here's the second one. We're still a work in progress when it comes to being generous. First, we think that there is little distinction, but that there is a distinction between tithing and generosity. We don't believe that tithing is being generous. It's required. Generosity is above and beyond the tithe. A few years ago, God had poured out a blessing on us financially, and he spoke to us and said he wanted us to give a certain amount to someone in need. And what it meant for us is that God blessed us to see if we would be faithful. He blessed us to see if we would give. The more we give, the more he's given to us. Not so that we can become rich, but so we can give even more. The other part about being generous is that it comes from our faith as we understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. It basically comes down to your relationship with him, your daily conversations with him. Do you respond or choose to ignore him? A couple more. One thing I've learned from my experience with giving is that you can't outgive God. I've tested him several times on this. A few years back, I made the decision to tithe based on gross versus net, and that same year, I got a bonus and a 12% raise, the largest I've ever gotten. A few years ago, I gave most of my savings to Mosaic's capital campaign that helped us get in this facility, but I have more in savings now than I did then. I don't think the reason God blesses us when we are generous is to reward us for being generous. I think it's so we can be more generous. And basically, it's because I think investing in God's estate is more worthwhile than investing in my own. One more. We give for a variety of reasons. On a purely scriptural level, I believe the Bible tells us to tithe and to give to God what is God's. In other words, we're only stewards of his resources, and we often trick ourselves into believing our money belongs to us by right. Furthermore, if he can't trust us with what he's already given us, why would he ever give us more? We also believe we live privileged lives and that we have a responsibility to care for others. We need to live with a community mindset where we lift one another up, particularly in times of need. Finally, another reason we give is because we show through our actions that we have faith in God and what God is doing and what is yet to come. So much of our treasure is not going to be found in this life. However, there are ways where we get to catch glimpses of this now. 
One particular meaningful moment with my husband and I sticks out in my mind. For our wedding, we asked people to give to a charity in lieu of giving us gifts. We felt like we had the rest of our lives to accumulate things, and we knew firsthand how much these children were in need. With the money we raised, we were able to hire an occupational therapist at a school for children with special needs in Kenya. As we continue to visit every couple of years, we have the incredible reward of watching children walk who couldn't walk, smile when they used to be withdrawn, and who've been able to use the rehabilitated lives to help even more people. I always feel so fortunate that we've gotten to experience even a fraction of what God has done with that money. It is also particularly meaningful since we haven't been able to successfully have children of our own yet. She wrote, I believe God sowed our tears and allowed us to be part of a community of children half a world away. I'm sure, she concludes, I'm sure there are many other reasons to give that we're still learning. I definitely don't think giving is a stagnant number. I think it should grow with your faith. We've enjoyed being a part of Mosaic, which in my opinion is a particularly generous church. Do you want all that God has to offer? Another way of saying it is, what kind of world do you want? Is God your get-out-of-hell-free card? Or do you want life to the full? I want to tell you one of my pet peeves, and um, this isn't in the Bible. It's just Carl's opinion. And so don't accost me in the lobby afterwards and tell me why you're right and I'm wrong because that may be true, but I have the microphone and you don't. So um, <laughs> one of my pet peeves, and, and I typically see this with younger couples um, who are, are maybe just married, uh, maybe even just engaged or something, uh, just starting their careers, don't have a lot of money. And what they'll say at Christmas time is, I'm not buying a present for my spouse. And, and, and they will be buying for other people, like extended family or, or parents or, or, or whatever that is. And what they either say explicitly or at least imply is, well, my husband knows how much I love him. Or, well, my wife knows I love her. That, you know, that person already knows how much I love them which I'm sure is true, but if they know how much you love them, then why not express it? See, my philosophy is even if I have to not buy a present for everybody else in the world, even my parents, even my kids, my wife will get a Christmas present from me, even if it's something small, just to say, hey, I just want to remind you I love you. See, here's the problem is I think a lot of us, a lot of us say, well, you know, I don't give to God, but he knows I love him. I mean, he knows what I feel, and I don't want to say I love God. I want to show him. I want to say, God, even if I have to neglect everything else in life that I desire, one, or sometimes even think I need, I'm going to show you how much I love you. And that's what God did for you. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave It doesn't say God so loved the world that he just zapped you with grace or God so loved the world that he sent the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not die but will have eternal life. See, that's what this is based on. It's not give because mosaics in need. We're not. It's not give because you feel guilty. The Bible says don't do that. It's give in response to the God who has saved your life for all eternity because you chose to reject him. You chose to do life your own way and say, God, I don't need you. I don't care what you say. I'm the boss of this life. But God loved you too much to leave you like that. He loved you so much that he gave his only son. The Trinity was broken as he sent his son Jesus to earth to suffer, to live, to die, but to rise again. And so we're going to conclude today by remembering the giving God by celebrating communion. In just a moment, there's going to be a tray passed down your row with a stack of two cups. I'd ask you to take a stack of those cups. One has a cracker representing Jesus' body. The top one has some juice representing Jesus' blood. And any time during this music or last song, you can eat and drink that. But let it remind you that God so loved you that he gave because he loves you. See, today isn't really about giving. That's a small part of it. 
Today's about the idea that God has a better plan for your life. He wants to do things in you and through you and with you that are bigger than what you can do on your own. But if you do things your way, they will not work. But if you do things God's way, he promises he will take care of you. Try me, he says. Test me. You know, I'm a pretty skeptical person of everything in life. And so if I'm in your seat, if, I, if I'm ever listening to any sermon or, or reading a book or anything, I, I'm always trying to figure out what's the loophole, what's the caveat. And here's, here's the caveat today. I'm just going to point it out to you is that if you don't tithe, you'll still go to heaven. You will. If you don't tithe, you'll still go to heaven if you trust Jesus. Now, there's two kind of clarifiers to that. One is, if you're not generous, do you trust him? And the other is, do you want all that God offers? Is God a get-out-of-hell-free card, or do you want all that God has to offer you? Generosity is the antidote to greed. Do you trust him? God so loved the world that he gave. So let's celebrate God's generosity right now in communion. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I know it is weird to talk about money in church. I know this has been done weird. I know people have been manipulated. I don't know. Maybe this even, what I've said, comes off as manipulative. I hope not. God, I know it's weird if it's your first time here thinking, you know, this is all they care about. God, when I envision the world we want, I see people who are debt-free, for whom money is a tool and not a drug, and who are extremely generous in all ways. God, we won't recognize if we're greedy, so help us be generous so we can know we're at least doing something in response to that. God, thank you that this isn't something that started with us, but it's something that started with you because you loved us so much you gave. And God, help us love so much that we give. Thank you for the cross and the empty tomb. We celebrate that now in communion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.